Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, uh, the weekly roundup of all the latest Nikon news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. This is Constantine here and here is Becky. All right, so what are the news, Bex? Uh, so the first big announcement yes. is new firmware, new movie kit, new opportunities. I like, I like the third one. Thank you to Nikon Marketing Department for that brilliant tagline. Mm, number 10 <laughs> out of Maxi Malaki. <laughs> That's right. So let's go through the improvements. Okay, so the first major update is actually eye detection on people that are quite far away. Mm -hmm. So before that, let's say um, if you want the camera to have face recognition, you had to be fairly close to the camera. Yes. Now it's not only detects your face from far away, but also detects your eye. Richie from Nikon has a really good video where he tests that and do have a look at it, where he walks back and forwards to the camera and from it, and it's basically detects his eye. Yeah, and you can also see here that he shows many different changes between firmware version 1.01 .01 and 1.10, so do check that out. Uh, we will include yeah. a link to his video in the description box and in the podcast notes yeah. for you. So the, the main improvements we will be seeing in full autofocus area, so it's effectively the full center, and um, in autofocus area large people, it's basically a big focusing square point, so about like one quarter of the screen, basically. Just for so, people. And just for people, and it will recognize your face or your eyes pretty much instantly. Yeah, excellent. Um, it also adds support for 4K... 60 frames per second. 60 frames yeah. per second, thank you. That's on Z6 Mark II. Mm -hmm. Now, Z7 Mark II already had it That's straight right. out of the box mm. with a tiny crop. Yes. So now Z6 Mark II shoots at 4K at 60 frames in, in DX crop, so it's 1.5 crop. Right. Now, this is while it is a crop mode, it's actually sharper than the 7 Mark II. And the reason for that is being because it's, there's a direct readout from the sensor, not pixel binion compared to Z7. Again, Rishi's video shows comparison between the two modes on Z, on Z6 and Z7 Mark IIs. And, well, Z6, for me personally, does look visibly sharper. Yes, it is a small difference, but if you are primarily buying the camera for video shooting, as you would be if you bought the Essentials kit, for example, then yeah. having the Z6 II as opposed to the 7 II does make sense for, for that particular use. Absolutely. And then the last feature, they do enable the Black Magic RAW output. Mm -hmm. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. It's effectively a ProRes RAW that is available for um, Ninja, Atomos Ninja recorders. But now you can use Black Magic recorders with that. And it's just a, a Black Magic RAW. That's how they call their RAW version. Yes. The camera has to be enabled for this. So it has to be sent for, uh, to Nikon for um, paid um, firmware updates. So it's about £200 in UK. But if you buy the Essential Movie Kit, which they also announced at the same time, then it will be pre-installed for you. Well, I wouldn't say free of charge, but yes, it comes with it. Well, it comes with it and you don't have to pay for it, essentially. Yeah. So what does it come with? What does the Z6 II Movie Kit come yes. with? So the new Essential Movie Kit is almost exactly the same as the Z6 Essential Movie Kit. Obviously, it has a Z6 II in it. It has a, a couple of e and e 15 cs instead of... 15 Bs. So those are new batteries as well. Exactly, uh, which you can shoot while charging, so you can have them connected via a USB-C cable to a mains outlet, for example. You've got the Atomos Ninja 5. Yes, so it's the same as the previous kit. Exactly, and the small rig, which is designed specifically, it's a small cage designed for the Z6 and Z6 II that allows you to have extra bits and pieces on there as well, add microphones, and um, and is very customizable as we Absolutely. Found. And the files for that thing are huge. So what you need to do as well when you're buying that thing is actually get the SSD drive that plugs into Ninja 5 or mm -hmm. let's say your Blackmagic device. Yeah. So don't forget about that. And you need really fast speeds if you want to record rules because I think one minute is like over a gigabyte or so. Yeah, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Couple of things I want to talk about. Um, so first of all, obviously we'll see improvement in the focus and the eye recognition. Now, a lot of companies came out with the eye recognition before Nikon. Yes. Now, the problem, in my opinion, is, and uh, Rishi is raising a legitimate question in his video, he's saying that, well, while you back quite far away from the camera, depths of field generally would cover the whole face. Mm. So you don't really need to have eye recognition at that distance. Yeah. You can just have a block on the face. However, it is a nice confirmation. I can see where it's coming from, but obviously it's good that Nikon is developing software that allows for that because obviously in terms of computational power, it has to do a lot more work. It does. And it also shows that Nikon are focusing a little bit more 
also on videographers yes. because that is a kind of, I'd say a key need for them more than anyone else. For photographers, you don't necessarily worry about AFI recognition when the subject is quite far away because yeah. you can just refocus. We talked a few times about companies needed to get the software right in their cameras because a lot of cameras from different manufacturers, they probably you know, use about the same parts. Yeah. So it's the software that makes sense. And we are really glad that actually Nikon does some progress in this space. Exactly. Next up, we have an update on Nikon presentation scheduled at CP Plus, which is happening this week from 25th to 28th of February. The main presentation uh, will be online, which you can you know register and attend on 26th of February from 3 to 5 p.m. But there also will be Nikon release presentations by different photographers available. And we have the schedule in the link below. So every day you'll have three to seven panels on Nikon related things for you to watch. Exciting. The next bit of news is an interesting one. Yeah, so Nikon have announced the development of a new one inch 17.84 megapixel stacked CMOS 4K 1000 frames per second sensor. Yeah, that's at quite the, something, isn't it? It is quite something. So they announced this at the International Conference on Solid State Circuits, which I, I didn't even know there was a conference mm -hmm. on, but apparently there is. Now, this has gotten a lot of people very, very excited, understandably, because Nikon developing their own sensor is... Hmm. Yeah. What so we me. heard before, that Nikon is using Sony sensors exclusively, nothing else. Mm. Well, actually, according to Tom Hogan, he says that actually Nikon sensor branch a branch. Branch, yeah. They've been active from 1988. That's right. They're just not allowed and about about it. So, but they've been developing sensors all the time. So this particular one, well, it keeps everyone excited. It's effectively developed for industrial purposes at the moment. Yes. The beauty of this sensor, it goes up to 135 decibels or 22 plus stops of dynamic range. Which is phenomenal. All right. What does it mean? Well, current cameras, actually hover over between like 12 and 14 stops of dynamic range. This thing can go to 22, mm. okay? So it's a one inch sensor. So obviously it's not developed as a full frame sensor. So I don't think it's coming to consumer cameras anytime soon. No. I personally think it's a cutting cost measure. So because it's easier and cheaper to produce smaller sensors, it's actually been produced on medium format sensor pipeline. But what they normally do is they cut them so yes. They produce a big stack and then they cut them, let's say, maybe in four pieces or something yeah. like this. But where would this be, let's say, used? That's the question. So essentially, based on its sort of shape and size, the hint is that it would be used in industrial fields. Yes. We don't know any more than that. There's nothing particularly, you know, there's no clues, yeah. shall we say. I'd say CCTV or somewhere yeah. in a highway where you need to leave the shadows, where the contrast is very important. Yes. We have a shot taken of very high contrast scene with very strong shadows and highlights. And the image at output is very readable because you can see details everywhere. Exactly. You wouldn't necessarily expect that kind of lower quality, let's say, from a DSLR. You'd want something a bit more. But at the same time, the examples are showing the extremes that this sensor is apparently capable of recording. But you never know. We may see it in the future in a consumer camera. Yeah, exactly. It could be the start of something quite great and beautiful. There are links in the description box uh, to both the announcement and also to our favorite Tom Hogan's article because he does make some very valid points about the sensor and sort of explains it in somewhat layman's yeah. terms if you're interested in that sort of thing. Tom Hogan watched 2021. <laughs> He's the one to watch. That's right. In another bit of Nikon news, Nikon released Eclipse SI microscope. Is it SI or SI? Does it matter? CSI. <laughs> it's an upright microscope with improved operability for educational and clinical applications. It could be a Spanish version. It could be C. C. Exactly. If that's your sort of thing and you're interested in Nikon microscopes, we will put the description and the announcement below for you to enjoy at your leisure. In another bit of financial news which you all love, but that's a quick one. Nikon Japan issued a release where they say that their subsidiary, which is called Chuchigi Nikon Corporation, based in Otavara City, remember, that's the one that actually has the factory left. Mm -hmm. So they're closing the other two, but they leave the factory there. Yes. All right, so they are merging with Jig Tech Company Limited. Well, effectively, they're not really merging, they're absorbing them. Like... <laughs> so Jig Tech Company Limited consists of about 40 people. 
and they uh, develop very specialized products. So what they're trying to do is basically, I think, in, um, in the matter of restructuring, consolidate the company mm-hmm. so they can maybe communicate better and produce things cheaper. Yes. Okay. Very good. Now, another bit of news from Japan. Nikon will repair damaged items caused by an earthquake with an epicenter off the coast of Fukushima Prefecture at yeah. a significant discount. Yeah. There's an earthquake happened in Japan on 13th of February, and Fukushima Prefecture um, was affected the most. Nikon issued a statement where they say, we would like to express our deepest sympathies to all those who suffered from disaster caused by earthquake. And they mentioned in the third year of Reva. So third year of Reva, they're referring to 2021, mm-hmm. which is the way the Japanese count their year. So it's to do with uh, their monarch. Sure. So what they say that if your favorite Nikon product becomes defective due to this disaster, we will give you a special discount on repair fee. From what I read, minimum discount is about 50%. For those who are affected, yeah. it's a good gesture from Nikon. It's a say. very nice gesture from Nikon, indeed. That is all we have for headlines this week. However... We do have a point of discussion. Yes. With current announcements of high-resolution cameras by other manufacturers, and it seems that Nikon is moving this way as well, Mm. I have a question for you. Okay. Is 24 megapixels now too small? Depends on what you're looking at. So does this come based on the fact that there's a lot of stuff flying around about 8K, 12K? etc so yes yes, i can understand why you would think 24 megapixels is too small because it doesn't allow you to then shoot at those in terms of video yes at those resolutions but that's the thing the video currently is pushing stills technology yes and the thing is we're looking at 4k cameras now shooting 60 frames per second look at nikon's Mm -hmm. 8k has been introduced into um, mirrorless cameras by other brands yes and now there is a talk about 12k coming in the next 12 to 18 months which is a lot of resolution considering that we don't even have the the viewing capabilities That's a lot of Ks, isn't it? At home. It's a lot of Ks. Yeah, 12 of them. But think about this way, yeah? So 1080p gives you 2.1 megapixels, right? So 4K is 8.3. You mean in terms of a still... In terms of still image, yes. Taken from that. Exactly. Right. So now 8K gives you 33 megapixel image. So in order for camera to shoot 8K, it's effectively need to shoot at least... 33 megapixels. In order to have that capability. Exactly. Okay, so I can see why you would want to then potentially have a camera that can shoot 8K, even if you're not going to use the video capability. Yeah, and then if you're talking about 12K, it's actually 80 megapixel sensor. Good grief. Now, with news coming out that Nikon can shoot 120 frames per second, yeah, yeah, um, at 1080p doing a screen grab, Mm -hmm. imagine if your camera does 8K, which is 33 megapixel image. Yes, and a screen grab, you know, then shooting at 120 or even 60 yep. p or frames per second at 80 megapixels with those 33 megapixels means that the, you can do an awful lot more you can, absolutely. with your stills camera. And a lot of stills photographers say, well, videography doesn't do anything to me. Well, actually it does because of this. Video is now pushing the technology for stills cameras. Mm. You can do a lot more, but... Another point I have with this is obviously we see where it's coming from, but in my personal opinion, is the technology moving too fast for us photographers? <laughs> for us photographers. I mean, certainly if you only intend to ever shoot stills and you have no interest in video whatsoever, like 24 megapixels is adequate. But imagine your camera does 4K 120 frames per second. Well, yes, then it would allow you to... What would it allow you to do? Well, it so it's, it's not, let's say, it's 7 frames per second or 10 frames per second for stills. You've got 120 as a still image. Yeah. So think about shooting flying bird and never missing a shot because you are effectively shooting 120 frames per yeah. second. Yeah, there are definitely some applications that that would be useful for. Absolutely. 24 megapixels has kind of been the, I'd say, the the level playing field for most mm-hmm. brands, most consumer cameras. Mm-hmm. Professionals possibly would be looking for a little bit more mm-hmm. for the purpose that they're shooting. I mean, if you are a fine art photographer or a studio photographer, commercial, you'd want more resolution. Mm-hmm. So having a camera that can shoot 12K, therefore having... All right, so let's cut the More mustard, pixels. right? Yeah. Um, is sense. 24 megapixels too small nowadays for you? No, <laughs> not for me. I don't think so. But I can see that technology is moving so quickly that at some point, before too long, we'll mm-hmm. probably be forced to have cameras that have more. Is resolution. it moving too fast, in your opinion? 
I think that it's moving inevitably, let's say. A little bit like Thanos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's inevitable. <laughs> and the the fact that that uh, consumer cameras are becoming a smaller market means that camera manufacturers are having to produce things and having to do something a little bit wilder in order to to keep the interest. Absolutely. I was actually thinking that in the last two, three years, we were kind of staying on the same senses, yeah. pretty much. Mm. And with these new developments, it seems like it's, a, it's, it's kind of accelerated the development of the new technology. That's right. For consumer, it's a win-win because while those cameras are going to be expensive and looks like five or six thousand pounds, it's a new normal nowadays, unfortunately. But what that means is that all this technology will trickle down eventually with the new generations and become cheaper. Yeah. So eventually it's a win-win for everyone. Exactly. Even the consumer cameras will start seeing these things. So we have the new Sony and the new Fuji cameras yes. and their capabilities. We're hoping that potentially CP Plus will see some announcements from Nikon. Oh, yes. What, what do you want to see from Nikon? I would like to see the Z8 or Z9 finally. Okay. I'd like to see the flagship Z camera. All right, place your bets. Place your bets right now. Um, I would also like to see some of the lenses that are on that roadmap. Mm -hmm. We need a macro lens. Yes. We need a long telephoto. Yes. So are we, are we need an FTZ Mark II. <laughs> we definitely need NZ30 as well. But the reason why I laugh, I think what we're actually going to see is updated roadmap. And that's it. Yeah, potentially. But Nikon can surprise us, as always. Yes. And as soon as we get the news, we will share the news yeah. with you. So, you know. No, I really hope that they're actually keeping things under wraps because we haven't seen any rumors about any upcoming products. No, exactly. So they're very tight. <laughs> they're being very quiet. I think that also not having what they call hard product launches where they take prototypes into dealerships to show them mm -hmm. a week in advance or a few days in advance whatever is actually helping them because yes. it means that there's no chance for leaks i i remember them coming to us for something i can't remember what it was yes. and it was already on nikon rumors that's true we actually knew what's coming yeah <laughs> before nikon had come with the yeah. official press re and um release for us so i think that doing it this way is probably yeah. going to give us a bigger surprise i'm hoping uh, we can we can live in hope. Yeah. <laughs> but one point about swap coming to k actually there's a black magic design camera. It's they generally cameras designed for videographers specifically. Mm. They already have a 12 K Ursa Mini Pro. Right. And that's essentially in in the APS-C sensor or DX sensor, we would call it. Yes. It's 80 megapixels. Right. In DX. In that DX format. Yes. Good lord. So technology is already there. Yeah. So it seems like it will be possible. Imagine what you know how large the full frame sensor in terms of megapixels will be. Yeah, exactly. I can't do the maths on that right now. But that was, that would be impressive. In your weekend read and watch segment, we have a couple of articles. One is Lens and Camera Repair Fundamentals by Richard Fall. Yeah, that's a long one. It's not just one article, it's actually a series of articles. But if you ever wondered what your lenses look like inside and how to potentially fix them, that could be a good article for you. Yes, maybe don't do it with your lens that is, or camera that is under warranty. <laughs> Just send that one off to yeah, Nikon. I think it's probably made for film equipment and manual focus equipment. Yeah, exactly. The next one up is Comparison Review, which was published by the Peer Review website, and they call it Can View Scan or Silver Fast Archive Your Film Better? Mm. For us, film shooters. Yeah. I love that you group <laughs> both in that. <laughs> so basically what the view scanner and silver fast, those are bits of software that allow you to use your film scanner or your flatbed scanner with film functionality, film yeah. scanning functionality, to scan your negatives or slides. Mm -hmm. And they compare the two and say which one is better. Now, the view scan is an interesting one because we've often used that to refer to people who have older Nikon cool scans, which I have to say still stand up as one of the best scanners uh, for negatives ever produced. I agree. Great shame that they were discontinued. The main problem with buying one of those old scanners is the fact that you can no longer get software or an operating system that works with those scanners. So ViewScan was always kind of where we pointed people to have a look at because it's it works with all the modern operating systems and makes your cool scan compatible with modern day computers, essentially. 
I own Viewscon, yeah. and so I do find it very interesting. A bit difficult to learn when you just start, but it's got kind of beginner, advanced, and expert mode, so you can start with that. And it supports all Nikon scans, mm -hmm. and it also works better than, let's say, if you've got an Epson scanner, let's say mm -hmm. V700, it works better than Epson scanner software, in my opinion. Yep, there you go. So do have a look at that article if you're interested in which piece of software is better for you. For us film shooters. <laughs> for your weekend watch, have a look at the link in the description box or the podcast notes if you're listening on a podcast. Uh, this is a thousand frames per second. Look at how 16 millimeter motion picture camera. By slow mo, guys. We love the slow mo, guys. Yes, they shoot everything in slow mo. It's fantastic and it's very interesting. So if you're if you've got a spare few minutes, go and have a look at that. It's quite fun to watch. Thank you for watching and or listening to us this week. If you do like our videos, please do subscribe and like. We would appreciate that very, very much. It means we can bring more content to you. You can also find us on Instagram. Yes. I am Rebecca underscore Danese. And I'm Konstantin Kochkin. Awesome. And if you do listen to us on podcast platforms, do leave us a review as well, please. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We will see you again very soon. Bye. Bye.